Rory Gallagher, Liam and Noel's less famous but much more talented brother. Oh, come on, guys. Give me, a, give me a break here. Come on. Anyway, Rory, as the most talented Gallagher sibling, was always more than just another gunslinging guitar player. He sang, played in a range of blues, folk, and jazz influenced styles. He wrote lyrics, played a bunch of instruments, and, of course, he did also play some mean guitar. The point is that there's so much more to talk about Rory than just his guitar playing. I wouldn't bother making this video otherwise, after all this isn't really a guitar channel and if you're watching this video you probably already know he's a great player. You'll know all about his great tone. So it was Rory that gave me my sound and that's the sound I still have, that's, that's my voice. His lead playing. <laughs> his rhythm, his electric stuff, his slide playing. His acoustic stuff. His vibrato. Point is that people talk a lot about Rory the guitarist, but not so much about Rory the songwriter. So let's see if I can set this right just a little. So firstly, look, I'm not going to pretend that Rory is a top tier songwriter or lyricist. He's very much a bluesman and his songwriting is hardly going to go down in history as wildly innovative or massively influential in and of itself. I think it's fair to say that from a musical point of view, his songs are pretty straightforward and all written within a relatively limited harmonic and melodic range. He wasn't a McCartney-esque tunesmith or a Jimmy Page level arranger, for example. Nor are his lyrics on a Dylan or a Mitchell level. They're mostly pretty workmanlike and to the point. But just because he wasn't a Lennon, a Wonder, a Kate Bush or whoever in the songwriting department doesn't mean that he wasn't still pretty good. Ultimately, it's not up to them that we should compare him. Next to other guitar heroes, he actually fares incredibly well. In my mind, the two most obvious comparisons to make with Rory are Gary Moore and Stevie Ray Vaughan. Gary, simply because he was the closest thing to an immediate peer that Rory had, both from Ireland, Rory from the Republic and Gary from the North, born within a short few years of one another, both are very much guitarist guitarists, both raised primarily on blues, though Gary was probably overall the more versatile electric guitarist and Rory a much more accomplished acoustic guitarist, and both with long solo careers spanning rock, blues, and related genres. And Stevie Ray Vaughan, well, put simply, any conversation about white bluesmen, as in those who sing, play, write material, you know, they just are the blues, any such conversation can only sensibly put Stevie Ray Vaughan or Rory Gallagher at the top, in my opinion. Like, who else is there? Eric Clapton? There's only about five years or so where I would really rate him in that regard. Mike Bloomfield? Not quite. Gary Moore? Too all over the place and probably actually better suited to metal overall. Joe Bonamassa? Too uncool. Sorry Joe. So I think it's just between Stevie and Rory then. Both sang, played, wrote and lived and died as bluesmen in a way that no other white player really did. So if we take Stevie Ray Vaughan and Gary Moore and we compare their songwriting skills to Rory's, well, in my mind, there's no real competition, to be honest. Rory blows both of them completely out of the water. Gary's songwriting was occasionally good. Often okay. and far too often inarticulate and clumsy, particularly from a lyrical point of view. It's just a young girl, she left her home for better time. And Stevie Ray Vaughan, well, amazing guitar player and singer, to say the least, but we're not really listening to Stevie for his songwriting. For one, he tended to do far more covers than Rory did. But with Rory, you are listening, at least in part, for his songwriting to a greater degree than virtually any other guitar hero out there. I guess Hendrix is the obvious exception and in a very different style, Prince. But there aren't many. Rory wrote folk songs, he wrote punk songs, rock songs, borderline heavy metal songs, jazz tunes, and of course, plenty of blues tunes. And every genre of blues can be found on Rory's albums. Country blues, jazz blues, Mississippi, Chicago, there's acoustic playing, there's slide stuff, everything. So although, of course, guitar playing is his main thing, it's not his only thing, and it's part of a pretty complete package. Which brings us around to Tattooed Lady. This is one of the first Rory songs that I ever heard, and it's still one of my favourites today. Tattooed Lady was originally released on a 1973 album, Tattoo, as the opening track. Tattooed Lady
in a way, it's a pretty straightforward sort of stomping barroom blues. Heavy, loud, fast. But there are actually a few things going on musically that you aren't likely to hear in your average blues song. It's rough and ready sound, but lies a couple little harmonic tricks worth listening for. So the song starts off really quiet with some faint guitar and accordion. Big carnival vibes for this intro then. Rory and the band soon come in with acoustic guitar, bass, drums, and some light electric guitar overdubbed. Not long after, we get that accordion back. The track builds the dynamics throughout by having these instruments come in one at a time. It's not super outlandish by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a nice touch. It keeps the momentum building, it holds our attention, and that kind of thing is really important for this kind of scrappy blues rock. Anyway, these verses really are super simple. It's just the trusty old E minor, C, D, back to E minor chord progression. Or it's the minor tonic, then it's a major chord built off of the flat and six, a major chord built off of the flat and seventh, back to that minor tonic. It's the chord progression that we've heard all rock musicians use, and Rory uses it himself all the time as well. Rory sort of catawalls his way through a frankly bare bones melody, singing mostly rhyming lines, though he's not super consistent about the scheme verse to verse. Things get a bit more interesting in the chorus, where we get that classic blues chugging riff in A going to E. He just dives headfirst into a big key change to the parallel major then, from verses in E minor to a chorus in E major. Not really something you'll hear very often in blues music, this sort of modulation to the parallel key is used much more in like late 60s baroque pop like the zombies and the turtles. <laughs> Plenty of Beatles. Plenty of progressive rock, in the sophisticated piano pop of Billy Joel and Elton John, people like that, show tunes, musicals, and of course, it's everywhere in classical. It really works well here. I love that change into the chorus and the developing dynamics of the song accentuate it. Some heavy electric guitar play comes in one of the channels and it stays with us through the rest of the song from this point onwards. Occasionally coming in with an odd little lick. Again, just a little bit of dynamic variation goes a long way in keeping things interesting. The chorus progression isn't just a straightforward blues though, so we start off by going A to E, the four chord to the root, then we go to C sharp minor, B, E. This is the minor chord built off of the sixth, the fifth chord, and then the root chord. Then we repeat with slight rhythmic variation, and then the post chorus bit. goes A, C sharp minor, G sharp minor, B, or 4, 6, 3, 5, then repeat. And then back into the verse chords for a cool accordion solo, then back into the chorus chords for a guitar solo, and then onto another verse, etc. So the chords are certainly not crazy or out there during any individual section, but there's that big change from E minor to E major. And in both the verse and the chorus, although the playing is bluesy, it's not really pure blues. That chorus progression is a pretty standard classic rock chord progression, but the 5 to 6 double stop riff gives it plenty of blues feel. And that B chord at the end of the post-chorus section, over which Rory plays an A note during his first guitar solo, making it a big B7 chord, leads us very, very nicely back to the E minor of the verse. Cool. It kind of reminds me of Good Vibrations. Both have a pretty similar chord progression in the verses. Whereas Good Vibrations is the minor tonic, then the flat seven, flat six, and then the five chord in E flat minor. Tattoo Lady is the minor tonic, then the flat and six, then the flat and seventh, back to that minor tonic in E minor. And then both go to a bouncier major key chorus, the Beach Boys mega hit going to the relative major and Rory to the parallel major. Then both eventually bring us to the dominant five chord and via that back to our minor key verse. The two songs obviously beyond that sound nothing alike, but it just goes to show how similar harmonic structures can be used to radically different ends in different contexts. So although nothing world changing, the progression is definitely interesting and effective. But let's actually look at what the song is doing as a whole. What's Rory singing about? Tattooed Lady is a song about being brought up in a traveling sideshow. Rory says, And the characters who populate the song are the carnival classics. Cliches, really. We have the eponymous Tattooed Lady, Bearded Baby, we have the Fire Eater, and we even have the owner or the manager of the entire affair. Wicked Sadie. This is all presented to us in the most straightforward and literal way. It's just a list of characters with bits of description of the day-to-day -day life of it all. Simple, really. Lady, 
The song mostly sticks to the internal world of the sideshow, its workers and attractions, with the young Rory clearly quite content living the itinerant lifestyle and unimpressed with the world beyond it. After all, he has everything he needs in this world. He has the shooting gallery, the fairground band, his adoptive family. There are only a couple of references to society outside the fairground. We have school, which is only mentioned in order to be dismissed, and then the DA and the police chief who try to shut down Sadie's operation. In spite of Sadie's moral dubiousness, She's no baby. the general lack of money, Push the penny. We had any and in spite of the nomadic nature of the fairground, It's still reliable and dependable. It's a place that can kind of exist in any place, while remaining stable and supportive enough to act as a home no matter what. It's sort of a community of outcasts on the fringes of society that welcomes and looks after its own. This is a trope that you can actually find across plenty of media. You see it in the 1932 film Freaks, where we literally have a travelling freak show, including an actual tattooed lady, who, in spite of the treatment they receive from outsiders, are actually the good guys, with a tight social circle and a willingness to look after and help each other as well as newcomers to the group. There's a certain moral ambivalence to them as well, I guess, just like Rory's sideshow inhabitants. You can see another variation on this trope in the first Toy Story film when Buzz and Woody find Sid's tortured toys. Hey, hi there, little fella. Come out of here. Do you know a way out of here? They're outcasts. They're mutilated and terrifying to behold, but ultimately friendly and helpful. I think there's a bit less moral ambivalence here with this iteration of the trope, though these toys are arguably quicker to take up arms than Andy's much more domesticated playmates, and they always retain that kind of outsider sort of edge. Anyway, as I said before, Rory was no Dylan-esque wordsmith. His lyrics just say what they say, and there's little in the way of metaphor or flowery language throughout this song. That's just his style, right? Unpretentious, down and dirty. He's always a bit punk, a bit garage rock. Laid back, genuine. I know I've used the word straightforward a lot already. It's that sort of thing. There's little in the way of affectation with Rory. What you see is what you get. <laughs> Affectation is a funny thing, isn't it? What do we mean when we say an artist or anyone is unaffected? It's not ever really 100% true to call anyone unaffected. All art, all human communication is on some level affectation. It has to be to work. You don't speak to your parents in the same way that you talk to a manager or your friends or a teacher or a random person on the streets. That would be weird. We switch registers. Rory's music and his lyrics are no exceptions. He's also affected, and that makes him... Phony! Hey, this guy's a great big phony! Come on, Chris. <laughs> but seriously, with Rory, there's a bit of a tension here in that he's an entertainer. He's entertaining. He's a showman. He's charismatic. He's also a good-looking dude. In many ways, the archetypal rock star. But he's also uncompromising, pure, straightforward, more concerned with just playing the blues than with any actual commercial success. Probably fair to call him unstylish? Or maybe mono-styled? He's simultaneously affected, then, and utterly unaffected. Not at all a rock star, in fact. I'm not the first to notice this. Brian May, in an interview discussing Rory Gallagher, recognises this when he says... And funny, funnily enough, he probably wouldn't think of himself as an entertainer. He's, he's such a pure man, Rory, you know. Uh, he, he thought of himself as a musician, and he never made any compromises towards being building himself into a superstar. I think Rory's elemental and people could sense that. There's no pretense whatsoever. There's no showmanship which hides what the real man is. And he just came on there and played and he would talk and and you felt like you had a one-to-one a -one relationship with him. Let's look at Tattooed Lady again then. This song has, at its core, one central affectation. Phony! Rory was never actually part of a travelling sideshow, though it sang as if it were. Now, this is really obvious, this is an obvious point to make, but singing about being brought up on a fairground when you weren't is an affectation. Now, again, it's really obvious, 
and it's not blatant and it's not over the top. It's not glam rock flamboyant affectation. It's not even massively theatrical or conceptual. That is to say, it certainly isn't progressive rock, but it also is a bit theatrical. It is a bit conceptual. So again, it is an affectation and that makes Rory a uh, phony. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna stop that, I will do that again. If you look at Rory's career generally, you'll find a broader set of affectations at play. The most important are those affectations built around the role of America in his songwriting and his style. It's hardly surprising, is it, given that Rory is a blues musician? And I'm not gonna blow anyone's minds by pointing it out, but it is worth talking a little bit about this as it's important both to his music and more broadly to British and Irish music of the 20th century. So firstly, Rory never sings in his Irish accent. His singing is mostly in a sort of transatlantic or implicitly American accent. He will occasionally go full fake American. The cactus blooms, the sand dunes, no city lights. I can see. The Clearly had a very straightforward Irish accent. Uh, I got it at about 71 or something in the States. This fellow was going around selling old guitars out of the back of a Volkswagen. So I was haunted to get it really, you know. So is this weird at all? Nah, he's in good company. Mick Jagger, Elton John, Robert Plant, Mark Boland, Van Morrison, The Beatles, Cliff Richard, Phil Lynott, Mark Knopfler, Jeff Lynne, Joe Cocker, Rod Stewart. Loads of, or most, British and Irish singers from the 50s, 60s and 70s sing with fake American accents. Now, some do it more than others and some do it better. But generally speaking, most non-American artists from those decades, at the very least, don't sing with their actual accents. And when they do sing with their actual accents, it tends to come across as a novelty thing. A wouldn't it be nice to get on with me neighbours? Or a joke. She's so good looking, but she looks like a man. Or it's just not really well received. Well, I've been the wild, wild ride. The Kinks were the first to really fully and unironically embrace their English accents, but they were well past their commercial peak when they went full English. Things changed a lot with punk and even more so with Britpop when Mancunian, Cockney, Yorkshire, Scottish and Irish accents became much more common on British records. Anyway, on top of the accent thing, Rory's songs are also overwhelmingly set in America. It's often explicit, not just in the lyrics, but literally in the titles of his songs. Just look at the track listings from his 70s albums. Half of them have at least one song named after a city, state, or area of the United States. We have Daughter of the Everglades. Tucson, Arizona. All is nice. Out on the Western Plain. Now I'm in a bunch of cowboys. No end to Jesse James. When the Mississippi Shake. Mississippi Shake. And those songs that aren't explicitly set in the US often reference American cultural tropes. Take the barley and grape rag. <laughs> which mentions Main Street, it mentions cops and federal cases. It's quite clearly an American kind of song. So obviously both of these things, accent and song setting, just come down to genre. After all, the blues is kind of just one long extended reference to early 20th century America. And we all recognize the importance of accent to genre. It's why Sting, for example, sings in a faux Jamaican accent on police records. And it's why a lot of American Canadian folk musicians will put on kind of old country accents when singing. It would be hard to say rap in received pronunciation without it sounding parodic. Like a meter ogre, a Sam or ginger, lap sang Sushon, raise my pinky finger. Singing country with a Scottish accent would be a bit strange. And try to imagine the Beatles singing something or Eleanor Rigby in a Scouse accent. Weird. I think we all implicitly recognize and categorize music by these generic trappings of accent and dialect. And even when someone is working against the conventions, it just acts as a subversion of the genre, like that posh rap I just played. So it's still kind of the same point. Accents matter. So if you're gonna sing the blues in an American accent with American cultural references, you're probably also going to implicitly or explicitly set your songs in America too. In Tattooed Lady though, Rory never actually makes it entirely clear where the song is set. If anything, it's a bit contradictory. There are two main location clues. Firstly, Rory sings that Sadie, when faced with the prospect of having her sideshow closed down, has the DA cheering and the police chief wearing her garter as a crown. So she had the DA cheering, the police chief wearing a garter for a crown. 
behave. <laughs> Which to me suggests the US. Now, most countries do have an analogous function to a district attorney, but it's only the US that calls them that, the DA. Okay, so we're in America then. But the other clue contradicts that. It's a subtle one though, so subtle you might have missed it. I missed it until I started researching for this episode. There's a line in a song about the pearly queen. So I had absolutely no idea whatsoever what pearly kings and queens were until, as I just said before, I was researching this episode. I just googled the term thinking it could be something relevant. And it is, at least I think it is. It turns out that pearly kings and queens are members of working class charity groups in London who decorate their clothes with mother of pearl buttons. Now, in my defense, I didn't know anything about this because I'm from the opposite end of the country. So I have an excuse for not knowing. So the mention of a pearly queen would suggest that the song is set in the UK. Hmm, America or the UK? Hmm, I wonder. Okay, so let's change direction for a bit here. We've all heard, I'm sure, the joke about the English teacher asking their class why the curtains in a story are blue. The teacher thinks that there's some deep symbolic meaning behind it, but actually it's just because the curtains are blue. Ha! Stupid teacher, right? Idiot! Blue curtains don't have to mean anything is the counter argument. Sometimes curtains are just blue. Mentioning details like that in a story doesn't need to be done for symbolic purposes. It can just do something for the story without them meaning anything. So why is that important here? Well, the meme and the reactions to it online are a nice little representation of the two extremes we often see people take when it comes to artistic interpretation. Take the over-analysis, what do the curtains actually symbolize approach. We could maybe say The American setting represents the blues music that Rory grew up on and plays, but just as the police chief and the DA weren't too keen on Sadie's improprieties, the American record-buying public never really warmed to Rory, who is much more successful in the UK and Europe. He's a white European, after all, and not, in a way, authentic. Maybe that belies blues. an anxiety about his illegitimacy as the a British player. The British Queen saved him in the lyrics. And this is a metaphor for how Britain, London specifically, was his commercial home. Most of his 70s albums were also recorded in London studios, so maybe we had to take the Pearly Queen as a stand-in And the city. as a travelling musician who toured the world, the parallels with the travelling sideshow are obvious. After all... <sighs> On the other extreme, we might say, well, that's just a load of nonsense. Rory was never the most detail-oriented lyricist, and paying that sort of close attention to a few offhand phrases is just a complete waste of time. Any inconsistency about setting could just be down to a lack of proper care taken in writing lyrics. Anyway, traveling sideshows did, you know, travel, and it certainly wasn't unheard of for the biggest or most successful to cross the Atlantic to tour both Europe and America. The archetypal sideshow P.T. Barnum certainly did. Rory was just singing a cool song about a fairground. No more, no less. Now, shut up and let's just put the volume up for this cool guitar solo. I think a better approach would probably lie somewhere between the two. Personally, I often find the super deep symbolism oriented analysis or interpretation of meaning boring and a bit pointless. And I say that as an English literature graduate, but I was just never sure what we meant to get out of that sort of approach beyond a feeling maybe of self-satisfaction and intellectual self-congratulations. And I've always been uncomfortable making claims about an artist's own thought or psychology based on interpretation of their work, which is unfortunately a really common approach to writing about literature, art and music. What I'm more interested in is explaining what we already unconsciously know about or get out of art, what the art does to us or for us. On the other extreme though, the this song is just a cool story about a sideshow position. Well, this sort of approach is just a little too anti-intellectual for me. I think it's super easy for people to just dismiss close readings of songs and texts as full of themselves without really engaging properly with the points being made. Doing this reduces all music composition and in doing so flattens the distinctions between writers and we lose what makes them individual and unique. Now, I'm aware that I've basically just set up two straw men only to act all smart and cool about tearing them apart. 
The point is, though, that the two positions aren't actually straw men. Lots of people do fall into either extreme. I think the meme is right to poke fun at people who do take literary analysis too far. But also, if you have ever come across this meme in the wild or just heard people talk about art criticism generally, you'll have heard or read people completely dismissing it all out of hand as pretentious nonsense. Let's look very briefly at the end of this song with this all in mind. Rory closes with a cool guitar solo over those verse chords, and then when the band finish on the E, minor chord, he concludes on E's flat and seventh, the D. On the one hand, I could say, oh, ending the song in this minor seventh is unresolved. Maybe he does it to put the rest of the song in question. Maybe it's implicitly pointing to the itinerant nature of working in a sideshow, always moving on, never settled. Maybe it represents the discomfort these outsiders and Rory himself has living in mainstream society. Blah, blah, blah. Or you could just say it's just a blues rock song. Resolving to a flat and seven isn't particularly weird. It just sounds cool. Or we could more sensibly say it's true that in blues and plenty of rock music and in jazz, resolving to a flat and seven isn't all that crazy. It's a chord tone after all in blues harmony. It does sound cool, but a standard part of blues vocabulary it might be, it still does sound unresolved and a bit unstable. It's a bit like ending a sentence, paragraph, or a story with a question mark. It just kind of feels a bit weird. But it's also true that it doesn't mean anything. It would be silly, I think, to ascribe some sort of specific symbolism to it. After all, on one level, it really is as simple as it sounds cool. Anyway... <laughs> I personally see this song and the role of America in Rory's songwriting generally, I see it all as primarily as a sort of escapism or fantasy, but an escapism and fantasy informed by Rory's actual life. Firstly, America was, and to many people across the world still is, inherently associated with a sort of escapism, whether economic, social or cultural. To British and Irish blues and rock musicians brought up in post-war economic deprivation, that goes double. The parallels with the first person of the song and Rory's actual life are certainly real, even if the specifics aren't. He may not have travelled the world with a carnival, but he did leave school at quite a young age to tour Britain, Ireland and Europe, and later the US. Tattooed Lady then is close enough to reality while injecting a bit of fiction into it for the sake of telling a better story. Blues itself seems to me to be the ultimate medium of escapism and fantasy for Rory, and it's a fantasy he lived through his music, via which he brings it to us. Importantly, Rory's music always captures a real sense of fun and real joy. Someone like Stevie Ray Vaughan is probably cooler in a flashier way, he's more dramatic and badass. Others out there are more technical, others are more sophisticated or innovative with what they do with blues music. But Rory is one of the select few musicians out there where there's never any sense of distance between his playing and you. It really does just feel pure, unadulterated, authentic whatever that word actually means. After all, how can it be authentic when it quite often clearly isn't? His songs aren't autobiographical at all, at least not in any literal sense, it's all ultimately affected. But, as I said before, that's just all art, right? That's just how it all works, by definition. It's all escapism to some degree, and the affectation doesn't make it any less authentic. So I played a bit of a Brian May interview clip earlier in this video and it's really telling to me that Brian portrays himself as a kid in the story where he meets Rory. And we we were boys, we hung around and hid whenever, when the marquee was at turning out time and then we kind of strolled over as if we ought to be there and said oh hello Mr Gallagher can we can we chat to you or whatever, you know, I don't know what we said. But he was incredibly patient, he was packing up his own gear, that's the kind of man he was, he was packing up his guitar and his amp and everything, and he had the grace to speak to us. He didn't go, get out of here, what are you boys doing in here? It makes sense, right? Rory was already travelling Europe and playing festivals in the late 60s while Brian was still a university student. But Brian was actually born the year before Rory. He's older than Rory. I think I do get, though, why Brian assumed Rory was older. To me, Rory is, 
to repeat myself, a true bluesman. There's something mercurial and otherworldly about him, while at the same time, he's as down to earth as they come. He's almost a walking paradox in that regard, and I think it all does come down to the fact that he lived the blues in a way that few others do. There's always a bit of self-mythologizing in blues, a little bit of the tall tale, maybe. Take Robert Johnson and the Devil, and legends of meeting at the crossroads and selling his soul. But it's rarely just pure invention, and it's not lying. There's a little wink behind the tall tale, and the audience is assumed to be in on it. Rory then is just working within the typical blues conventions when he reframes his youth within the fiction of a traveling sideshow. Well, He was a bluesman then, not really a rock star, even though his music often exists right on the boundary between the two genres, just like Tattooed Lady does. And I do think the distinction between a bluesman and a rock star is important, and I think it's what Brian May was unconsciously recognising in that brief clip. Rory, compared to his immediate peers, feels like he's from a different time and a different place. As a travelling blues musician and an Irish blues musician at that, starting his career in the late 60s, he's sort of behind the times and out of place. But that sounds a bit pejorative and I don't mean that at all. What I'm ultimately trying to say is that this is the sort of escapism and fantasy that Rory's music works at producing. He takes us with him to these times and places by adopting the generic vocabulary, musical, lyrical and narrative appropriate to them, i.e. the blues. It's a world that he creates in his music that rock musicians can't because rock music is a different genre that works in different ways. It uses loads of blues tropes and vocabulary, sure, but it is different and we know that. You need a blues guy to do what Tattooed Lady does and to do it in a way that balances a bit of affectation with a lot of authenticity. Well, for that, you need Rory Gallagher, aka the coolest member of Oasis. <laughs> <laughs> Please like and subscribe and all that stuff. Thanks.